Now open your question paper and look at part one. You'll hear three different extracts. For questions one to six, choose the answer, A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract one. You hear part of an interview with a broadcaster who's talking about a series of programs he presented about landscape painting. Now look at questions one and two. Why did you decide to include a painting by a famous politician? Well, I wanted to remind viewers that amateur painting has its own purpose, uh -huh. uh, that scores and scores of people paint for themselves, as that politician did. And I liked his daughter's explanation that it helped to give him some respite from the pressures of public life. I thought that was important to focus on, so that we weren't just talking about painters as professionals who had really cracked it and who taught us things about their technique. <laughs> You draw yourself, don't you? Yes. <laughs> I've always liked it, though I'm afraid my attempts aren't very good, so I keep them purely for my own amusement. <laughs> uh, the intensity of drawing is always a great thrill. Uh, I can't say it's a relief, which it obviously is for some people. Uh, you have to use your eyes to look more carefully at a scene than you would if you were just out for a walk or even if you were taking a photograph as an amateur. There's something about drawing that forces you to see things and think about them. Now you'll hear the recording again. Why did you decide to include a painting by a famous politician? Well, I wanted to remind viewers that amateur painting has its own purpose, uh -huh. uh, that scores and scores of people paint for themselves, as that politician did. And I liked his daughter's explanation that it helped to give him some respite from the pressures of public life. I thought that was important to focus on, so that we weren't just talking about painters as professionals who had really cracked it and who taught us things about their technique. <laughs> You draw yourself, don't you? Yes. <laughs> I've always liked it, though I'm afraid my attempts aren't very good, so I keep them purely for my own amusement. <laughs> uh, the intensity of drawing is always a great thrill. Uh, I can't say it's a relief, which it obviously is for some people. Uh, you have to use your eyes to look more carefully at a scene than you would if you were just out for a walk or even if you were taking a photograph as an amateur. There's something about drawing that forces you to see things and think about them. Extract 2. You hear an amateur pilot called Gina Nesbitt talking about doing aerobatics in her small plane. Now look at questions 3 and 4. I've only ever been up in a plane once where the pilot turned the plane over in an aerobatic display and I've never been more scared or felt sicker. Do you get that sinking feeling too, Gina? I'm very fortunate in that I don't. This came as a pleasant surprise to me because I do get terribly seasick. I find that what's routine and what I'm used to doing isn't frightening. Learning some of the new maneuvers, though, can be quite daunting because this is a single-seater plane, so the first time I do anything new, I'm on my own except for the guidance of my coach, who's on the ground. What's the real thrill for you of performing these difficult manoeuvres in competitions? It's exciting, of course, but ultimately the reward comes from knowing that you've done it with precision. It involves an unusual combination of mental preparation, physical preparation and skill. It's not as difficult as you might first think to fly the sequences of movements. What is difficult is doing it to a high enough standard to avoid the faults the judges are looking out for. Now you'll hear the recording again. I've only ever been up in a plane once where the pilot turned the plane over in an aerobatic display and I've never been more scared or felt sicker 
Do you get that sinking feeling too, Gina? I'm very fortunate in that I don't. This came as a pleasant surprise to me because I do get terribly seasick. I find that what's routine and what I'm used to doing isn't frightening. Learning some of the new maneuvers, though, can be quite daunting because this is a single-seater plane. So the first time I do anything new, I'm on my own. Except for the guidance of my coach, who's on the ground. What's the real thrill for you of performing these difficult manoeuvres in competitions? It's exciting, of course, but ultimately the reward comes from knowing that you've done it with precision. It involves an unusual combination of mental preparation, physical preparation, and skill. It's not as difficult as you might first think to fly the sequences of movements. What is difficult is doing it to a high enough standard to avoid the faults the judges are looking out for. Three, you overhear a chef called George talking to a friend about his daily routine. Now look at questions five and six. I'm exhausted. It took an hour to drive five kilometres. You should do what I do and use a motorbike. Is it much quicker? It is a bit because you avoid some queues. The great thing is, when I put on my helmet, I'm shut away. You know, in my own little world, and that means I arrive feeling quite calm. I started riding a motorbike where I grew up in the country because there weren't any buses. So is that your most prized possession? I was asked recently what my favourite thing at home was. As a chef, I imagine yours is something in the kitchen. Your cooker, perhaps. The one at the restaurant is fantastic because it was specially designed for me. It's hard to say here. My family love the kitchen table where they chat for hours. <laughs> Given the late hours I work, I hardly participate in that. No, my workplace is so hot and sticky that what I long for is a shower when I get home. I feel the stress of the day disappear with the water. <laughs> Odd thing to choose, isn't it? Now you'll hear the recording again. I'm exhausted. It took an hour to drive five kilometres. You should do what I do and use a motorbike. Is it much quicker? It is a bit because you avoid some queues. The great thing is, when I put on my helmet, I'm shut away. You know, in my own little world, and that means I arrive feeling quite calm. I started riding a motorbike where I grew up in the country because there weren't any buses. So is that your most prized possession? I was asked recently what my favourite thing at home was. As a chef, I imagine yours is something in the kitchen, your cooker, perhaps. The one at the restaurant is fantastic because it was specially designed for me. It's hard to say here. My family love the kitchen table where they chat for hours. <laughs> Given the late hours I work, I hardly participate in that. No, my workplace is so hot and sticky that what I long for is a shower when I get home. I feel the stress of the day disappear with the water. <laughs> Odd thing to choose, isn't it? That's the end of part one. Now turn to part two. Part two. You will hear an art teacher called Rosa Weston giving a talk about making mosaics, works of art that are made out of small pieces of glass and stone. For questions seven to fourteen, complete the sentences. You now have forty-five seconds to look at part two. I'd been teaching art for about ten years when I went on holiday to Greece. 
While I was there, I became really interested in the art of making mosaics and decided to include this in the courses I run. Many people assume that the Romans invented mosaic, but it was the Greeks who were the true craftsmen, and they, in turn, probably picked it up from the Sumerians. But it was the Romans who brought mosaics to Britain. And apart from the introduction of nylon backing to hold the tiles together, the techniques themselves haven't changed much over 5,000 years. It's the designs which have undergone a really radical change. In the recent past, modern mosaics have been restricted to the walls of public libraries and the odd swimming pool, and, by and large, it looked as if the true art of the mosaic could well disappear. Fortunately, that has not happened. People often ask me why I prefer to spend hours teaching my students to stick tiny squares onto tiles when I could be doing something else. And it's certainly the case that the process demands both time and motivation on occasions. It can even give you a really bad headache. <laughs> but in fact, there's something very therapeutic about it. I think it has something to do with breaking things up and then reconstructing them. For every course I teach, we have jars and jars of brightly coloured glass, odd bits of china, broken plates and dishes, and most people just can't wait to start sticking them onto larger stretches of concrete. For the beginners, we produce mosaic packs, which contain all the essentials you need and explain clearly how to go about things. Each course includes a weekend workshop, which is attended by the majority of the students, and it's actually a wonderful way of relaxing. I'm often asked if I do puzzles, and it's not such a silly question as it sounds, because it's a very good comparison of skills. Some people do get a bit scared, faced with all that choice, but that's why the mosaic packs are so popular. But I try to teach people to be inventive as well. If you look around yourself, there's plenty of evidence that the art is enjoying a revival. Not only do you see mosaic ashtrays and soap dishes, but you can actually now find them decorating underground station walls. Now, I'm not suggesting that you start pulling your own home to pieces and replacing everything with mosaics, although I often find myself looking at chests of drawers and thinking, hmm, just a border, perhaps. Still, my reply to my over-anxious students is, all right, I know it takes hours, but after all, it's a labour of love and you have something which will give pleasure for a long time afterwards. Now, if you're interested in trying out the effect in your own home... Now you'll hear the recording again. I'd been teaching art for about ten years when I went on holiday to Greece. While I was there, I became really interested in the art of making mosaics and decided to include this in the courses I run. Many people assume that the Romans invented mosaic, but it was the Greeks who were the true craftsmen, and they, in turn, probably picked it up from the Sumerians. But it was the Romans who brought mosaics to Britain. And apart from the introduction of nylon backing to hold the tiles together, the techniques themselves haven't changed much over 5,000 years. It's the designs which have undergone a really radical change. In the recent past, modern mosaics have been restricted to the walls of public libraries and the odd swimming pool, and, by and large, it looked as if the true art of the mosaic could well disappear. Fortunately, that has not happened. People often ask me why I prefer to spend hours teaching my students to stick tiny squares onto tiles when I could be doing something else. And it's certainly the case that the process demands both time and motivation on occasions. It can even give you a really bad headache. <laughs> but in fact, there's something very therapeutic about it. I think it has something to do with breaking things up and then reconstructing them. For every course I teach, we have jars and jars of brightly coloured glass, odd bits of china, 
broken plates and dishes and most people just can't wait to start sticking them onto larger stretches of concrete. For the beginners, we produce mosaic packs which contain all the essentials you need and explain clearly how to go about things. Each course includes a weekend workshop which is attended by the majority of the students and it's actually a wonderful way of relaxing. I'm often asked if I do puzzles and it's not such a silly question as it sounds because it's a very good comparison of skills. Some people do get a bit scared faced with all that choice but that's why the mosaic packs are so popular. But I try to teach people to be inventive as well. If you look around yourself, there's plenty of evidence that the art is enjoying a revival. Not only do you see mosaic ashtrays and soap dishes, but you can actually now find them decorating underground station walls. Now, I'm not suggesting that you start pulling your own home to pieces and replacing everything with mosaics, although I often find myself looking at chests of drawers and thinking, hmm, just a border, perhaps. Still, my reply to my over-anxious students is, all right, I know it takes hours, but after all, it's a labour of love and you have something which will give pleasure for a long time afterwards. Now, if you're interested in trying out the effect in your own home... That's the end of part two. Now turn to part three. Part three. You'll hear part of a radio program in which two people, Sally White and Martin Jones, are discussing the popularity of audiobooks. For questions 15 to 20, choose the answer A, B, C or D, which fits best according to what you hear. You now have one minute to look at part three. And today, our subject for discussion is audiobooks. We have two guests in the studio, Martin Jones, who owns an audio bookshop, and Sally White, whose job it is to abridge or shorten books for the audio market. Now, I was amazed to find out just how popular it has become to listen to books on tape. What do you think is the reason for this, Sally? Well, people are often very short of time. If you commute each day and have to spend, say, an hour in the car, then you can listen to part of a tape and then go on where you left off. And many people like to listen to audio books while doing monotonous household chores like ironing or dusting. However, I suspect that it's when people are trying to drop off at the end of a busy day that greatest use is made of them. I suppose it's like being read to as kids. Yes. And in fact, these audiobooks have also become popular among children. I often listen to them with mine. I suppose the fear here is that children will become lazy. I mean, it's much easier to listen to a story than read it yourself. Yes, of course it is. But I'm not sure this will necessarily put children off reading. I don't know. But the great thing is that they can listen to books which are far too difficult for them to read. Oh, it may mean, of course, that busy parents are tempted to put on a tape rather than take the time to read to their kids. But then I'm sure many would actually prefer to listen to professionals rather than tired mums and dads. <laughs> what do you think, Martin? Well, I'd like to tell you about a lady who came into this shop just last week. 
and she was telling us about these family driving holidays to France, which used to be a disaster, with the kids in the back making a row, not being able to understand French radio. And she swore she would never take them to France again. Then she discovered audiobooks, and suddenly the journeys there are a joy. Now, I hear that audiobooks are even more popular in the States. Yes, it's certainly a huge, huge market in the States, although I don't think audiobooks started there. Maybe it's because there's a tradition here in the UK from radio of spoken words being an acceptable medium, whereas in America, of course, it's a different story. In the main, Americans don't seem to get as much drama or stories on the radio, so they're going out and getting audiobooks. And the principal attraction is that they need something to listen to because of the time they spend on the road. Places are so much far farther apart. An audiobook passes the time. And what are the reasons for sometimes asking the author to do the reading rather than employing a professional? Oh, it depends. Obviously, the author is the one who's closest to the book, and they may have a particular interpretation of the book that they are anxious to portray. Most authors will have already done public readings of their books anyway, as part of their promotional activities at the time of publication, so they've probably read parts of it already. Otherwise, professional actors are used. We're very lucky in Britain to have such a wealth of actors who can bring the story alive completely. Now, Sally, your job is to abridge books especially for the audio market. I suspect a lot of people would say that you shouldn't mess about with what an author has written. Oh, no, I don't agree. Most of the abridgments these days are really extremely good. Abridgers interpret the story in the way they believe the author has written it. But the point about abridgments is that one's adapting it to create a new version of the story, so it will inevitably be different to the original. Now, obviously, some books are easier to abridge than others. <laughs> yes. I'd imagine a thousand-page volume by Charles Dickens must be a bit of a nightmare. <laughs> well, what we do is to trim the excess off, so it's more to do with the way they write. Beryl Bainbridge, for instance, writes so beautifully and sparsely that it's harder to cut into her than Charles Dickens with his pages of detailed descriptions. Well, this is probably the case with any kind of book. Uh, we, we shouldn't forget that many books are not abridged before being taped. I would say that these have now grown to account for about 20% of the audio market. So, yes, some people do prefer to listen to the whole book. We've got Anna Karenina that has just come on the market. It's on 24 tapes, so uh, you can imagine how long it is. 24 tapes? How long is a tape? Well, each tape is about 90 minutes, and the whole set comes to £90. Pounds. Though it's a lot of money, we're talking about a lifetime's listening, which is really something, isn't it? <laughs> well, thank you both very much. And now... Now you'll hear the recording again. And today, our subject for discussion is audiobooks. We have two guests in the studio, Martin Jones, who owns an audio bookshop, and Sally White, whose job it is to abridge or shorten books for the audio market. Now, I was amazed to find out just how popular it has become to listen to books on tape. What do you think is the reason for this, Sally? Well, people are often very short of time. If you commute each day and have to spend, say, an hour in the car, then you can listen to part of a tape and then go on where you left off. And many people like to listen to audio books while doing monotonous household chores like ironing or dusting. However, I suspect that it's when people are trying to drop off at the end of a busy day that greatest use is made of them. I suppose it's like being read to as kids. Yes. And in fact, these audio books have also become popular among children. I often listen to them with mine. I suppose the fear here is that children will become lazy. I mean, it's much easier to listen to a story than read it yourself. Yes, of course it is. But I'm not sure this will necessarily put children off reading. I don't know. But the great thing is that they can listen to books which are far too difficult for them to read. Oh, it may mean, of course, that busy parents are tempted to put on a tape rather than take the time to read to their kids. 
But then I'm sure many would actually prefer to listen to professionals rather than tired mums and dads. <laughs> what do you think, Martin? Well, I'd like to tell you about a lady who came into this shop just last week, and she was telling us about these family driving holidays to France, which used to be a disaster, with the kids in the back making a row, not being able to understand French radio. And she swore she would never take them to France again. Then she discovered audiobooks, and suddenly the journeys there are a joy. Now, I hear that audiobooks are even more popular in the States. Yes, it's certainly a huge, huge market in the States, although I don't think audiobooks started there. Maybe it's because there's a tradition here in the UK from radio of spoken words being an acceptable medium, whereas in America, of course, it's a different story. In the main, Americans don't seem to get as much drama or stories on the radio, so they're going out and getting audiobooks. And the principal attraction is that they need something to listen to because of the time they spend on the road. Places are so much far farther apart. An audiobook passes the time. And what are the reasons for sometimes asking the author to do the reading rather than employing a professional? Oh, it depends. Obviously, the author is the one who's closest to the book, and they may have a particular interpretation of the book that they are anxious to portray. Most authors will have already done public readings of their books anyway, as part of their promotional activities at the time of publication, so they've probably read parts of it already. Otherwise, professional actors are used. We're very lucky in Britain to have such a wealth of actors who can bring the story alive completely. Now, Sally, your job is to abridge books, especially for the audio market. I suspect a lot of people would say that you shouldn't mess about with what an author has written. Oh, no, I don't agree. Most of the abridgments these days are really extremely good. Abridgers interpret the story in the way they believe the author has written it. But the point about abridgments is that one's adapting it to create a new version of the story, so it will inevitably be different to the original. Now, obviously, some books are easier to abridge than others. <laughs> yes. I'd imagine a thousand-page volume by Charles Dickens must be a bit of a nightmare. <laughs> well, what we do is to trim the excess off, so it's more to do with the way they write. Beryl Bainbridge, for instance, writes so beautifully and sparsely that it's harder to cut into her than Charles Dickens with his pages of detailed descriptions. Well, this is probably the case with any kind of book. Uh, we, we shouldn't forget that many books are not abridged before being taped. I would say that these have now grown to account for about 20% of the audio market. So, yes, some people do prefer to listen to the whole book. We've got Anna Karenina that has just come on the market. It's on 24 tapes, so you can imagine how long it is. 24 tapes? How long is a tape? Well, each tape is about 90 minutes, and the whole set comes to £90. Pounds. Though it's a lot of money, we're talking about a lifetime's listening, which is really something, isn't it? <laughs> well, thank you both very much. And now... That's the end of part three. Now turn to part four. Part four. Part four consists of two tasks. You'll hear five short extracts in which people are talking about starting a business. Look at task one. For questions 21 to 25, choose from the list A to H the reason each speaker gives for starting a business. Now look at task 2. For questions 26 to 30, choose from the list A to H the comment each speaker makes about their business. While you listen, you must complete both tasks. You now have 45 seconds to look at part 4.
speaker one. I'd never really considered starting my own business until last year. My friends were always on at me about what a good idea it would be, but I couldn't see the point. It wasn't as if I didn't have a good job. But then, when there was talk about reducing the workforce, and I was offered a lot of money to leave, I thought, why not try setting up on my own? I suppose I realised that I really didn't have that much to lose. There were the usual initial problems, of course, most of them financial, as I struggled to get things off the ground. But I don't regret my decision. Speaker two. Although I know a lot of people are forced into this position through redundancy or whatever, in my case it all started when I fell out with my boss about a sales plan. He was so patronising, and suddenly I felt I just couldn't take any more. Next day I went back and handed in my resignation. The thought of having my own business had always been at the back of my mind, I suppose, and this seemed the perfect moment to go for it. My wife had mixed feelings at the time, but she can hardly complain now. We've never been so well off, and can now look forward to a comfortable retirement. It's such a relief not having someone looking over my shoulder the whole time. Speaker three. My husband had always liked the idea of rural life, and when a job in a village school came up, he felt it was a chance he couldn't miss. The move to the country was difficult for me, though, because it meant having to give up my position in a really good company. I could have commuted, but it would have taken hours every day. There were no businesses like that in the area, so it was a case of setting up on my own or going into early retirement. I couldn't have managed without a computer and access to the internet. I must admit that I miss my colleagues, but I make sure I see them if I'm in London. Speaker four. The idea came to me after we'd had a lot of work done on our house. It left us really hard up, and I found I was having to do a lot of the making good myself to keep costs down. Although I was a complete novice, friends who came round commented on what a great job I'd done and kept on at me to do up their places. It was a bit of a leap in the dark because I was trained as a careers advisor, but I've managed to persuade a friend of mine who does have some experience to come in with me, and here we are with our own little decorating company. Although I've yet to make my fortune, every job brings a fresh set of challenges to overcome, which is something I never had before. Speaker five. We've spent several years trying to bring up children and have careers at the same time. So we knew how little time working people had to do mundane jobs like making a dentist's appointment or cleaning the car. So when I read a feature about a company in the U.S. which you could call to do these everyday tasks, I thought, what a brilliant idea! Within a year, we'd set up our own company, and our feeling was right. There certainly is a great demand for this type of service in the U.K. as well. It shouldn't be long before we start making a real profit. Now you'll hear the recording again. Speaker one. I'd never really considered starting my own business until last year. My friends were always on at me about what a good idea it would be, but I couldn't see the point. It wasn't as if I didn't have a good job. But then, when there was talk about reducing the workforce, and I was offered a lot of money to leave, I thought, why not try setting up on my own? I suppose I realised that I really didn't have that much to lose. There were the usual initial problems, of course, most of them financial, as I struggled to get things off the ground. But I don't regret my decision. Speaker two. Although I know a lot of people are forced into this position through redundancy or whatever, in my case it all started when I fell out with my boss about a sales plan. He was so patronising, and suddenly I felt I just couldn't take any more. Next day I went back and handed in my resignation. The thought of having my own business had always been at the back of my mind, I suppose, and this seemed the perfect moment to go for it. My wife had mixed feelings at the time, but she can hardly complain now. We've never been so well off, and can now look forward to a comfortable retirement. It's such a relief not having someone looking over my shoulder the whole time. 
Speaker three. My husband had always liked the idea of rural life, and when a job in a village school came up, he felt it was a chance he couldn't miss. The move to the country was difficult for me, though, because it meant having to give up my position in a really good company. I could have commuted, but it would have taken hours every day. There were no businesses like that in the area, so it was a case of setting up on my own or going into early retirement. I couldn't have managed without a computer and access to the internet. I must admit that I miss my colleagues, but I make sure I see them if I'm in London. Speaker four. The idea came to me after we'd had a lot of work done on our house. It left us really hard up, and I found I was having to do a lot of the making good myself to keep costs down. Although I was a complete novice, friends who came round commented on what a great job I'd done and kept on at me to do up their places. It was a bit of a leap in the dark because I was trained as a careers advisor, but I've managed to persuade a friend of mine who does have some experience to come in with me, and here we are with our own little decorating company. Although I've yet to make my fortune, every job brings a fresh set of challenges to overcome, which is something I never had before. Speaker five. We've spent several years trying to bring up children and have careers at the same time, so we knew how little time working people had to do mundane jobs like making a dentist's appointment or cleaning the car. So when I read a feature about a company in the U.S. which you could call to do these everyday tasks, I thought, what a brilliant idea! Within a year, we'd set up our own company, and our feeling was right. There certainly is a great demand for this type of service in the U.K. as well. It shouldn't be long before we start making a real profit. That's the end of part four. There'll now be a pause of five minutes for you to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. Be sure to follow the numbering of all the questions. I'll remind you when there's one minute left, so that you're sure to finish in time.